All right, so if you got a kit from me for the class in the mail, I would have sent you a couple pieces of cottonwood. This is a piece of cottonwood baseboard that I cut and a piece to be able to carve your spindle. And you can see the gray on it. That's uh, kind of weathered and all dry material. And you got a flat hand piece. Um, that's your bearing block from above. Um, you got a willow bow and your one is not carved yet here but you got that for your bow in the mail and then a piece of parachute cord um, for your bow and then you may have got if you asked um, for the extra piece of um, deer skin reverse wrap cordage and that's another piece of cordage for a bow and then um, you didn't get a knife in the mail sometimes I, se I send out a knife but this is my knife I've had since I was 10 years old um, this is from the Sami people in northern Scandinavia and it's all reindeer reindeer antler reindeer hide uh, reindeer antler here and then this is Bjork or the birch tree burl and um, so bush man and woman's best friend right here the knife all right so we're gonna build the kit and Starting off, let's make the spindle. So basically what you're gonna wanna do is make a cylinder out of this or a dowel. And the best way to do that is to get your two round ends first on either end. So I kind of come around like this. If you don't know good knife safety or ax safety, um, please refer to the video I made on knife and axe safety first and learn how to handle these tools so you don't hurt yourself and that's really important in the woods um, in a survival situation particularly you don't want to get cut or hurt yourself out there that's gonna make your situation go from tough to worse so I got that, just a nice circumference, kind of rounded. I'm gonna move over to the other side. And I got this knot right here that I can see, so I'm just gonna get that out of there. And you can use, I'm, I'm using my thumb behind the knife to basically get a little extra pressure. This is a good spot if you have a little hand saw you could just saw it or a hatchet or a machete to get through this quicker but this also works well I'm actually starting in here some of the shape that I'd be doing a little bit later on but since I've got to take this little piece off I'm already working on making a little spindle end in there once you have that pretty good you can usually come and just knock it off. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna come and do the, the round circumference on this side, kind of matching the, the diameter I did from the other side. The better you're able to get a round spindle or um, a nice cylindrical spindle, like a dowel, that's the easier it's going to spin inside the cord and the less it's going to wobble, which makes makes fire starting harder if you have like a wobble. So so getting that. <clears throat> so now I got a nice round end and another round end and then all I have to do now is just make the rest of this round to match these two ends. So I'm just taking out the material necessary to get that to all even out. And one important thing is you can even see here where this piece split. You can see how the split started here at the surface and then slowly went deeper and deeper and deeper until it broke off in here. And that's because of the grain of this wood. Um, it's able to split along the grain and the grain is going at an angle here. And so what you want to be really careful with is that if carving in this direction, which is against that grain, um, 
you have this, if you put a lot of force, you can split down deep really fast and then split a chunk off. And then that's gonna mess up your spindle. Um, so you actually wanna reverse it and carve with the grain. And so that anything that you're carving here is actually gonna wanna split out towards the surface if you do start splintering bits off. Um, and then you won't mess up your spindle that way. And so the best way to do that if you don't like readily see the way that the grain is going is just to proceed slowly, taking little chunks and just kind of whittling away, um, but not putting tons and tons of force into it. So then if you ever do see um, a, a big splinter coming out uh, with the grain that's diving deeper into your spindle than you would want, you can just stop it before it does split that way and splinter. Um, and not all woods do you have to be careful like that, but with cottonwood you do. And um, so cottonwood is literally my favorite wood for Bodro fire. And, but it's a little bit slightly more advanced whittling for making the, the components. So, here we go. So when you're doing this at home on your own time, you don't need to move this fast. This comes from 20 years of experience making a fire and maybe at least 32 years of whittling pieces of wood. So I'm moving pretty fast just for the sake of this video, but um, on your own time, just take your time. And you know, what I'm doing constantly as I'm doing this process is I'm noting the you know what the shape is taking shape and I'm, I'm i'm really keeping in my mind's eye exactly what i want this final thing to look li like you know about my thumb width and um a really nice dowel rod like a wood rod that you might have in your in your closet or hanging your hanging your clothes on nice cylinder This side is getting a little bit trickier because this direction is against the grain. So that's the direction I haven't wanted to cut. So I've been going with the grain this entire time. But now that I'm getting close to the end, it's closer to my fingertips. And so, you know, I'd usually want to just switch around and start doing this. That would be safer for my hands. Um, but that's against the grain. So I can actually, I run the risk of really splitting a huge chunk off and kind of ruining my spindle. And so I'm gonna work as close to the end as I can, holding on and uh, you know still carving away from my hand. So I'm, I'm gonna work as much as I can um, with the grain. see because of that original big split I'm actually having to bring this down a little bit smaller in diameter to match the the thinnest section here so I get my, my round dowel that way and so <clears throat> When 
I can't really do this safely anymore. Um, get, can't get really closer to my hands. I am going to spin it around now and start to work against the grain. And to, to do that without splitting big chunks off is I'm going to start from this end and slowly work this way so that if I split here, this would take a, a bigger chunk off. But if it has like areas where I've already taken some out, it'll just split into that. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But like you want to just kind of work from the end back in and that taking little chunks off and that helps it uh, protect from splitting a big chunk out. So then that way I can proceed into these sections actually against the grain. The reason that is, is I'm cutting off, um, I'm cutting chunks out of the trajectory of, of how the, the grain goes. And so when it does split from further back, it runs into the area where I've already cut it out and then it just, it takes a little chip out. But if I'd come from way back in here, it can split all the way through. Right, so that's looking pretty good. Um, I'm carving one of the the pieces here that was like a reject for me shipping out because of that bigger split. So you're not going to really run into a situation where you have that little missing piece in in your kit. And I'm not going to take this little section to a perfect cylinder just because it would be really skinny. So my, my spindle will have a little bit of a wobble when I try to use it to make fire. Um, and I have the skills to be able to like make up for that and still successfully make the fire. And for your first kit, it's a really good idea to aim for perfectly round material and not have any kind of wobble going on when you're making it. So you can see it's still still quite round and so now we come to our ends and we're going to give them a little bit more of a point aiming for that point to be right in the center of our circle. And then we can just kind of break off the tip and flatten it a little bit. We'll do that on both sides. Again, at home, you can just pause this video, take your time, rewind it, study it, and take your time making this material you really can take probably three or four times longer, at least than the speed in which I'm doing it right now, for your first few times to learn how to, to do it and do it right. So, there's that, again, kind of centered. All right. So we have that, that's our spindle. Usually they say that's about your shaka distance and thumb width. Baseboard, we'll just take a knife and go like that. And that's a good, a good starting hole. You just need enough for this end to sit in.
Then you also picked up one of these um, in your kit. So you just kind of want to go around this outer edge. Again, I'm always going away from my thumb. Um, and then you can kind of work around and take this edge off. On both sides, taking the edge off. Until it feels good in your palm and that's just to take that that edge off so it's not painful to hold and then here I already had this one dug out um, but I'll just demonstrate on this side um, if you had the fresh one you know just do the same thing like this and all you need is enough to get one of these sharp ends to sit and what's going to happen is you're going to burn both ends in. And so <clears throat> if you received, you most likely received the uh, parachute cord from me. And so, but the same, the same knots work for natural cordage. But we're going to start with a clove hitch. And I have another video you can look on online for... Uh, knots and hitches for friction fire and um, it goes into these a little bit more in depth but you're taking you're making a clove hitch which is basically just two overlapping loops where both of these running ends and tail end uh, get trapped inside and then put that over the end and cinch it tight this is a great knot for rock climbing and sailing and all manner of affixing a line for safety it's a very very solid knot and then this what i what i did on top of that was an extra half hitch so i put a clove hitch and then in this scenario the clove hitch can can meander a little bit so i throw a half hitch over it and that just locks that all into place and it doesn't budge I'll show you in a moment why, why I love the clove hitch so much for this. So this is how you build a clove hitch uh, two pieces at a time instead of making both loops at once. So this is why it's cool because you have the half of the clove hitch is just this half hitch. And I can now move this and adjust it and feel the tension um, that I need here. And so sometimes your, your rope is too tight and sometimes it's too loose and so this gives you this ability to take it apart adjust really easy and then you add the other piece and then even here you know basically we're putting when we put the spindle in we'll be locking it in like like this but right now see i can see oh that's too tight because the parachute cord doesn't really stretch that much. It's not that dynamic compared to natural cordage, which stretches a lot. So I can feel here, I actually need this one looser. Um, so now I can just like pull on that slightly and it adjusted. And, and then I can cinch it. I can add that extra half hitch like that. And, and then I can test it. And I can see that's still like quite tight, but that's that's about right. So, all right, so we got that in. And again, the way to do that is enter from underneath. And then you're wanting both of these to spin on then onto the outside. And then, and then you're bringing that and trapping it. So, now we're going to burn in our kit and basically we'll put this end down in the hole down here and then we have the little hole we made on this side and on top and we're going to burn both sides initially. Um, body position is pretty important here. You want to be able to lock your wrist into your shin and that's going to be able to hold all these things like perpendicular to each other so the bearing block is perpendicular to the spindle which is per perpendicular to your hearthboard or your baseboard
and then we just get some friction going. And you want to get smoke from both your hand piece, your bearing block, and the base right now. So that's called burning it in. <clears throat> now, this is now matched to that hole. And this is matched to your bottom. Um, what I like to do now is I like to make a little mark on the side, a little notch on the side that is for my, my bearing block. Because what I'm going to do now is um, I'm taking a little of this material off so that it doesn't burn anymore. I don't need it to do any more friction up here. And then I won't be losing energy into friction in my handpiece, and it won't be getting hot in my hand anymore. So I'll do that, and then I'll get a little bit of soap, put it on the end, put soap in here. Um, you know, animal grease can also work if you don't have soap. You can also rub this on the edge of your nose and get the grease from the sebaceous glands of the nose, or maybe use some earwax if you're in the bush. Um, and then you'll have this lubrication here and that will take all the friction out of the top piece and, and, the, and no energy will be going towards friction up there anymore and all your energy will be going into making a coal. So next step is to carve your notch and going in here creating a little pie slice and I'm marking in the center and then off center a little bit out to one edge and then I'm coming out and creating this little pie slice and then so I got that those marks coming out to the outer edge and then I come out and I take the top the top point of where that mark touched the outer edge and I go perpendicular straight down perpendicular straight down like so and then I, ha I then I have the markings of exactly what material I need to remove
All right, so that's like a, a good carved notch ready to go. And you'll see it kind of travels in, but not all the way to the center. And then you'll see that there's also not like a huge gap in width at the outer edge of the of the burn circle. If if you're if this gets too wide, and um, you get a bigger notch right at this edge, when you're when you're making your kit, when you're making your fire here, um, there's like enough of a space there that this is easier for that to pop out, and that makes it hard to make fire. So. That's prepared now to make a coal, make a fire. Um, the next thing that I'll do on my kits is, um, you know, this is how you prepare. Um, when you first, your first one, when you have that little point, you can make it that way by just making a little teeny hole. But now that this is burned in and it's uh, flatter, we need to prepare it like this. And so I just take the tip of my knife and mark this circumference like that and this is also now how I'll start to prepare my board um, and have it ready to go um, in case I'm being asked to go light a fire for some event or for a ceremony or something like that um, I want to have to be more prepared um, and so I mark these circumferences out and um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to basically connect the dots now. And then once all those dots are connected, I can break the material out. And then once it's broken out like that, I can uh, you know, I can burn that in again. And that's like how I might have a kit prepared for, um, you know, when I arrive at an event, like this hole right here with a notch is giving me like three, four, five, with this type of wood, maybe even six attempts to build coals with this notch alone. Um, but then if for some reason I like burn through here and I'm not able to get fire and I got a bunch of people watching and waiting, you know, I don't have to go through all these steps over here. I can just carve another notch and build the fire, or you could even have another notch down here prepared, ready to go. Um, and that way, you know, everyone's not having to watch you go through that whole process. But even if you find yourself in that situation, uh, just tell a story while you do it and um, remain calm and bust your fire out. All right, so this is ready now to go light a fire. So let's go over to our, our mud oven and get our fire going for pizza night. So you're gonna try to use as, as much of the bow length as you can to get the uh, most back and forth for each most bang for your buck here. And then make sure you're all lined up perpendicular. And then once it gets nice smoke going, usually about 12 passes with a good amount of smoke equals a coal. When you see the ash pile build up and you see a little plume of smoke shoot out the bottom or the middle of it, that means there's a coal inside there. Sounds like my car. Once it gets running, it quiets down. Little 
twig. Lift this away. If it's like windy out, you gotta do this more protected. And maybe be careful with your tinder bundle so you're not knocking it down. A little fire baby in its little home. mud oven lit up here for pizza night. I just want to tell you what my teachers told me that when you learn how to make fire in this way you should do the best in your ability to answer any call to come light a fire if someone asks you to light a ceremony or, or a wedding something like that um, do your best to show up for those kind of requests I've followed that call for the last 20 years and me some cool places and that's what my my teachers taught me so i'm passing it on uh, see you at our next pizza night